A few weeks ago, I preached a message where I identified what I referred to as an occupation of the Lord, an occupation. Isaiah 9, 6, it says, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. You remember that? Just a few weeks ago, I preached on God the Counselor. And He is a counselor. Does He give good counsel? Yes. Well, that's all He gives. You'll never receive better counsel. No. And you know deep down in your hearts that the best counsel that you could ever receive, He's provided through His Word. Amen. Yes, sir. He's provided you with good counsel. Can I tell you what you're going to need? You're, you're going to need to navigate this life. Counsel. After counsel. After counsel. How do you suppose your life's going to turn out if you continue to receive bad counsel and listen to bad counsel? God's beating his head against the wall. Why won't they just read my word? <laughs> Why won't they just listen to my counsel? If you've raised teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. Why won't they just listen? <laughs> like, I don't want, they don't want to hear anything. Well, often we're the same way with the Lord. We listen to our own counsel, and our own counsel becomes our worst enemy. <laughs> you will never receive better counsel than what the Word of God provides you. Amen. Never, 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 never. It's pure, pure counsel. It's patient counsel. It's persistent counsel. There's a message there. There's a three-point outline for you. <laughs> I'm sure you can find the verses to back that up. <laughs> Over in the book of Hebrews, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If you hear God speaking to you, harden not your hearts. It's good counsel. Now, that's a specific occupation. Let me give you a more general occupation for the Lord. It's more general. He's a manual laborer. You say you're reducing God to a common laborer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's hands-on. You know why Jesus came to this earth? To take a hands-on approach. He was there, he came here, and he put his hands on this thing. He got his, did Jesus ever get his hands dirty? He got his hands dirty. You ever get your hands dirty for Jesus? <laughs> huh? He got his hands dirty for you, didn't he? Yep. And most people just get their hands dirty because it pays, the, it, it, it pays the bills. It puts some money in their pocket. Jesus got his hands dirty. I'm going to show you three times that Jesus got his hands dirty, and maybe we can learn something from that. You think? Yeah. Look at Psalm 143. Psalm 143. We're just going to read a couple verses here. I want you to know something about your God. He sent His Son, the King of the universe. You know, in general, kings don't get their hands dirty. <laughs> yeah. Kings' hands are pristine. They're well manicured. They're soft. They're not calloused. And when they want something done that's a dirty job, they get somebody else to do it. That's your normal king. You think Donald Trump changing the oil in that, in that Cadillac? Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be a great picture? Here's President Trump. Carl's like, that'd be awesome. <laughs> You're never going to see it happen. He's got other people to do that, to do the dirty work. You need to learn something about your God. Jesus was not that way. It's a wonder why the common people heard him gladly. The common man. If he lived like most kings, the common people wouldn't hear him gladly. He got down on their level, didn't he? They got their hands dirty and so did he. Look what it says in Psalm 143 in verse 5. 
David says, I remember the days of old. Something we can learn from that. Especially in the, the atmosphere that we're living in today. I remember the days of old. You'd better never, for, never lose sight of history. Right. You'd right. better never lose sight of the past. Amen. Right. That'll get you in a lot of trouble. Yes, you know you can learn from the past? Yep. So if you start tearing it down, guess what? Right. You're stupid. Exactly. <laughs> That's what you are. Yep. You learn nothing. Right. You're going to repeat it. There you go. David says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. And then he says, I muse. What's that mean? It means to think, doesn't it? I muse on the work of thy hands. God works with his hands. We could spend a couple hours and I could show you so many works in the Bible, verse after verse, of the works of his hands. And then in verse 6, David says, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land, say la. Second coming. <laughs> Maybe you've seen Christians before, they lift up their hands to the Lord. Why? Why would you stretch your hands to God? I suppose there's a couple different reasons. You're acknowledging that He exists. <laughs> that there is a God. David says, I'm musing on the works of His hands. I meditate on His works. And then he stretched his hands unto God. You think another reason to stretch your hands unto God? Say, God, you did all this work with your hands. Take my hands. Use my hands. I give you my hands. To do your work. As a church, we should take a hands-on approach. We should get our hands on this thing. You need to get your hands dirty for Jesus. Because he got his hands dirty for you. Did he? I remember the days of old. You know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus bloodied his hands for you. You know, if you get blood on your hands, immediately you're going to think, I need to get the blood off my hands. You know, walk around with blood on your hands? People be like, that guy's crazy. Look at the blood all over his hands. He can wash that stuff off. That's a stain. He did that for you. We just sang about it. More about Jesus. You know what you're going to get at Lighthouse Baptist Church? More about Jesus. I love preaching about Jesus. And you should love hearing about Him. True biblical Christianity is hard, hard, hands-on work. You know what the ministry is? It's work. It's hands-on work. Some of you are like, I'm glad I'm not in the ministry. Are you saved? Are you a part of the body of Christ? You are in the ministry. Whether you know it or not. What would you say? Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4 quick. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I just want to have time to get through this, amen. I, I hate being rushed, and sometimes I rush myself. Yeah. Ephesians 4 and verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Is that talking to just pastors? No. That's talking to the body of Christ. Yes, That's the church. Your calling. Can I tell you your calling? It's a hands-on calling, and you're going to get your hands dirty. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all, verse 7, but unto every one of us. Who's that? How can that not be you? 
is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You're gifted. God gave you the gift of salvation, and he's gifted you, and you know what you're supposed to do with your gift? Use it. You weren't one of those kids that when you got a gift, you kept it in the box. You ripped into that thing and said, I'm going to use this thing. And it broke that day. And it broke that. Kevin, you ever break any toys? No, never. He Repent. What? Don't lie in church. Don't lie in church. Look down at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, Amen. that he may have to give to him that needeth. You know why we work? We work to give. Amen. We work for the Lord to give back to Him. Amen. Why? Because He used His hands to work for us. Right. Maybe we should muse on that. <laughs> know what David said? That we should muse on the works of His hands and remember the days of old. You remember the days of old when Jesus was actually walking on this planet? Working the works of God. I think he says, one of the Gospels, My Father worketh, he says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Yes, he does. And I work. That's what it says. Does God ever stop working? No. It's like I'm just, just going to take a day off. <laughs> never sleeps, never slumbers. Jesus worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked with his hands. What do you suppose the hands of Jesus looked like? If you had, to, I've never seen them, but if you had to describe them, what do you suppose his hands looked like? You suppose they were manicured and soft and stained, rough, worn, Weathered? I bet Jesus washed his hands often. It wasn't because of the coronavirus. <laughs> it's because he worked. He worked with his hand. Can you lend a hand? You know, even if you don't have hands, you can lend a hand. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm not actually talking specifically about these things, although you can use these things for God. But when you hear the expression, you need to get your hands dirty, that doesn't necessarily mean you're actually getting your hands dirty. That means get busy. Let's get the job done. There's a job to do for the church, for the ministry, which you're a part of. You can't escape it. You in the body of Christ? You're in the ministry. You know what Job said? Job said in, in chapter 37, He sealeth up the hand of every man. Now, I know that might be talking about your fingerprints and all that, but notice what it says. It says that all men may know His work. If God checked your hands right now, what would He see? How would He discern your hands? If God looked at most people's hands, he'd say, yep, they're just working for themselves. They're just working for this world. They're just working to please themselves and not working to give back to me. You know, the whole world is indebted to Christ. They don't have to believe that. They don't have to know that. They don't have to acknowledge that. It doesn't matter. It's a fact. And here we are, the body of Christ. We know the truth. Amen. You're indebted to Christ to give back. 
Maybe this morning someone would stretch forth their hands unto God. Say, use, use me. I love that scripture back there. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Send me. Jesus worked with his hands. Did he work with his hands? Amen. And often he got his hands dirty. I don't like getting my hands dirty. <laughs> Who likes getting their hands dirty? Did you get your hands dirty working on my car? Repent! <laughs> Can I ask you to pray for my car? That's my Toyota. It's not in good shape, and it needs help, and it needs a miracle. So it needs some prayer, and we need some wisdom, especially him, because I don't know anything about cars. I don't like getting my hands dirty. But I'll tell you what, it's necessary to give God your hands and say, Lord, use me. Look over in John chapter 6. Now we'll be in John here for just a little bit. John chapter 6, look at verse 27. Jesus said, labor not for the meat which perisheth. What would that mean? Have you ever labored and then got a paycheck and then the next day it's gone? <laughs> and then you say, where did it all go? <laughs> Have you ever labored and got a paycheck and then you paid your bills and then you say, God, I've got this for you. And Lord, I'm laying this up for you. This is for you. I'm taking my labors that I worked with my hands and I'm giving back to you. Can I tell you something? If you do that with the right heart and the right motive, it won't perish. You know how long it'll last? Forever. But he says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, why don't you say this this morning? Why don't you say this to him? What shall we do that we might work the works of God. And I wonder in the back of the Lord's head, he might have thought, I'm glad you asked because <laughs> I'm about to tell you. I'm about to show you three times that Jesus got his hands dirty and I believe we can learn something about this if you'd give him your hands. You going to give him your hands? Are you going to ask this question, what shall we do that we might work the works of God. Did Jesus labor for his heavenly father? Did he? Were his labors in vain? Were they ever in vain? Did all of his labors and works matter? Do they still matter? Oh my goodness, they matter in my life. They still matter and they'll always matter. You know what will be in heaven? You'll remember the days of old and the works of Jesus Christ and that thing will extend out for all eternity, His works, and so will your works for Him. And the works of this world and the works of man will perish with this world and will perish with man and they'll be long forgotten, won't they? I pray that you have some lasting works. Let's muse on that a little bit. Let's muse on the works of his hands. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Familiar story here. What's this story? This is the woman caught in adultery. You familiar with this story? I pray to God you're familiar with this story. You can relate. Can't you relate? You say, no, she was caught in adultery. I was never that. You're a law, you were a lost sinner <laughs> without Christ, a lawbreaker, falling short. You're no better than her. <laughs> Familiar story. But in this story, I see the hand of Jesus Christ at work. 
and I see help for sinners. Help for sinners. Can you help a sinner? Did Jesus help sinners? Yeah, he helped me. <laughs> I see help for the sinners. You, you don't have a problem with that word sinners, do you? You should be familiar with what that is. Yeah. I see help for the sinners. Can you help a sinner? Yeah. You can help a sinner? Yes, Jesus helps sinners. Look at verse, eight, verse 4. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Where did he write, his, where did he, where did he write what he wrote? In the dirt. In the dirt. What a place to write. You'd think he'd just pull out a tablet or something and pull out his, his Sharpie. <laughs> Maybe that was the only place to write. So Jesus stoops down, and with his hand he writes in the filthy dirt. Verse 7, so when they, con so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger in the dirt. Not once, but twice. So what did he write? Here, let me let you in on something. When God writes something... Mm -hmm. He writes only the Word of God. <laughs> How could he write anything other than the Word of God? He wrote on the ground. He stooped down and he wrote on the ground. You know what he wrote? He wrote the Word of God. You know what he did? He spelled out the Word of God to them. Why? To try to help a sinner with his hands. You know, the best thing that the church can do for sinners is spell out the Word of God to them. What's that mean to spell it out? When you hear that, what's that mean? Just spell it out. Just say it straight. Just tell it like it is. That might be an old expression. Some of the young people are like, what does that mean? <laughs> Just spell it out, man. <laughs> tell it like it is. Give it black and white. Let God take care of the details. He stooped down on the ground and with his hand in the dirt, in the filthy dirt, he spelled out the word of God to him. Why? Is he trying to help him? You know what you'll find in this story? It hurt them. It said they went out and their conscience was convicted. Right. You're me, you mean you're telling me that the God of love yeah. would write something that would bring conviction, that would bring shame, that might bring some guilt. That's exactly what he did. And they all went away, starting with the, the oldest to the youngest. They all were convicted in their conscience, if you read that story. And there was only one left. Yeah. You know, the one caught in adultery? Yeah. The sinner. Did she leave with any help? You know it did. Neither do I condemn thee. You know when God says that to you, what a blessing. <laughs> but he stoops down and he gets his hands dirty to spell out the word of God to some lost sinner. You know what God can use your hands for? To help some sinners. Amen. Have you received the gift of eternal life? Yes, sir. Yep. The gift of salvation. Amen. God gave gifts unto men. 
Have you received that gift? May you not be that Christian. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's only mine. Can you help a sinner? No, I've been in this business long enough and I can tell you it's a dirty job. It's a dirty job. Was Jesus willing to dirty up his hands to help a lost sinner? There's a whole lot of muck and there's a whole lot of mire to wade through to try to reach a sinner, isn't there? You know why? Because sin's dirty business. It is. I know for a fact, and you know for a fact. I've had considered I've had I've had sinners come to me and confess some dirt. Sin messes you up. I've had sinners sit down and talk to me. You know why? Because they're looking for help and they open themselves up. And then you've got to wade through all that dirt and all that sin to try to reach them, to try to be a help to them. Maybe that's why so many just say, you know what? Eh, I'd rather not get involved. <laughs> right? yep. I'd rather not get involved with that because I, in, I might get entangled with all that. And You said it's none of my business. Yeah, it is your business. I don't want to get involved. I don't have time. Did Jesus have time? Yes. I don't want to get involved. I, I, I wouldn't know what to say. That's your fault. <laughs> it's not God's fault. Can I spell it out for you? Sinners need hands-on help. And it's a dirty job. And Jesus was willing to do it. He came to help sinners. And then in the end, the Bible says he went a little further. You ever read that? And he allowed sinners to drive the nails and stain his hands with blood. He bloodied his hands for the sinners that drove the nails. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Did Jesus take a hands-on approach? I don't know how you could take a more hands-on approach more so than hands nailed to a cross. Isn't that a hands-on approach? <laughs> for who? For sinners. For you. For me. For them. Can you help them? Is that part of the ministry? Part of the ministry is helping sinners. Is that part of the ministry? Are you in the ministry? Are you in the body of Christ? Did Jesus help sinners? Did he get his hands dirty for sinners? Well, how about me and you? You have no idea if you spell out the word of God to a sinner, whether they like it or not, what kind of a help that can be to them Amen. in the future. Right. When the Holy Spirit of God uses that little seed, that little mustard seed, that you sowed in them. Right. Look at the next chapter. You mean Jesus gets his hands dirty in the next chapter? Oh yeah, he's always getting his hands dirty. He's always working with his hands. John chapter 9 verse 1, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So quick to judge. So quick to judge. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works. <laughs> work, 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 work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. 
As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Well, you want to talk about holy water. That's holy spit. He spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. What do you suppose his hand look, hands look like? Are they dirty? Hmm, that's interesting. And said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Not a tough operation. <laughs> it's not some big challenging thing. Did Jesus get his hands dirty? The first one was help for sinners. This one is help for the sightless. For the sightless. It says as Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man. And how did he see a blind man? Let me tell you about Jesus. He was always aware of his surrounding. You know why he saw the blind man? Because he was looking. You know what we pass by every day? Opportunities. Because we're not looking. We're in our own little world, in our own little bubble, doing our own little thing. That wasn't Christ. He was always aware of his surroundings. You know why he saw the blind man? Because he was looking for an opportunity to help somebody. Did he help this blind man? Oh my goodness. If you're blind and then you can see, that's a big help. <laughs> if you're blind and you can see, now you can go down to the DMV. Isn't that a big help? Did he help this blind man? Did he get his hands dirty doing so? Well, that's interesting. So he stoops down on the ground, he dirties his hands up to help the less fortunate. I'm glad I can see. You, glad, you take it for granted. So do I. Not a blessing to be able to see and hear and walk and talk and all that stuff. Can you help the less fortunate? I'm talking about those that are actually in need. There are still some folks out there that are actually in need and cannot help themselves. That's this man. He can't help himself and he's a miracle. Well, Jesus comes by and he dirties his hands up and he performs the miracle and the man was blind and now he can see. Did he help him? Man, did he help him. This man's suffering from circumstances out of his control. Isn't he? Here's a man that could not help himself. Couldn't help himself. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his parents' fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. But the purpose for his blindness was to bring glory to God. Amen. That Jesus might come by and work the works of God. It's another good reason to support missions. Missionaries are in a position to help the poor of the poor. Many of them. And the weak of the weak. There's another good, I mean, one good reason to support missionaries is because they're preaching the gospel to help sinners. Another good reason is because they're dirtying their hands up and leaving this country and going to some third world country to help some that are less fortunate that cannot help themselves. Isn't that part of the ministry also? Absolutely. Did you know that there are over 20 million orphans? You say, where in the world? No, just in India. <laughs> it's just in one country. Over 20 million orphans. Did they deserve that? Come on. Is that out of their control? What could they do about it? I saw a documentary one, one time. There's this guy that he goes into some of these third world countries and he he goes in there with nothing, no money, no nothing, to try to survive, homeless. He went to India, and he got around some folks, and what they did all day long, like 10 hours a day, they would, they would walk around their city and collect cans, 
plastic and glass bottles. After 10 hours, they'd have some bags full, they'd take it back and redeem them and get enough just to get enough food to survive the day. And they do it day in and day out. You know what he found out? This is hard work. You know what else he found out? Boy, are we blessed. Amen. Maybe the reason that we don't see the less fortunate is because we're not looking. Right. Right. Jesus was always looking. And he dirtied his hands, didn't he? Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Amen. All right, last one, John chapter 13. Help for sinners, help for the sightless. John chapter 13 and verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth up from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. And after that he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I don't need to tell you this, but that's a dirty job. Now, we don't walk around like they did over there. Everywhere they went, it was dirt. They, they didn't have sidewalks. They didn't have nice roads. They didn't have bike paths and all that stuff. They had sandals and they had dirt. And I suppose most houses had a water basin. Before you came into the house, you washed your feet because your feet got filthy every single day. Every time you went out and come back, your feet are dirty. Come out, come back, your feet are dirty. Your feet are always dirty. That's a dirty job. And Jesus took it upon himself to stoop down again. <laughs> and do the dirtiest job in the house. Did he have to? He chose to, didn't he? He chose to. They could have called a servant, they could have called one of the kids and say, wash these disciples' feet, and they would have obeyed and wash their feet. Could the disciples have washed their own feet? Well, I'm sure, I hope you wash your feet. <laughs> Susie laughed. Hope you wash your feet. Could they have washed their own feet? Jesus insisted. Yes, he, did. he insisted. Yes, he did. So this is help for the saints. Help for the sinners. Help for the sightless. Help for the saints. We don't have time. I could take you through story after story of those saints that have helped me in the past 20 years that have been such a help to me. And they went out of their way and they insisted to serve me. You know, we learn about Jesus here. We learn that he has a servant's heart. A servant's heart. And rather than let his disciples do this dirty job, he did it for them. And he dirtied his hands for those that are in the body of Christ, the church. You know what we should be? We should be helping one another. We should be loving one another. If you were in Sunday school, we should be like-minded one towards another. That brother and sister has a need. I can fulfill that need. Okay, so why don't you? I think it comes back again. I don't want to get involved. <laughs> My own business. I mean, use some wisdom. But if you see a need and you can fulfill that need, but it's a sacrifice, thank God it's a sacrifice. 
If it's not a sacrifice, what reward will you have? <laughs> Here's Christ with a servant's heart. Let, let us muse on the works of his hands. The king of the universe. Getting his hands dirty. The king of kings. Lord of lords. Getting his hands dirty for sinners. Getting his hands dirty for the less fortunate. Getting his hands dirty for the saints. Working with his hands. Just like with that blind man, Jesus was always looking for an opportunity to help one of the saints, wasn't he? Maybe you know this verse, Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Jesus said in John 13, but this shall men, by this shall men know in verse 35, that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Look at verse 15. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Can I tell you what Christ is? He's an example. And he's a pretty good one. Pretty good example, isn't he? He's a pretty good example of a man. You know, Jesus was a man. He was the son of man. He was the God man, but he was a man just like me and you. And he used his hands to help. You know what, Christ? His hands were helping hands, weren't they? They were helping hands. They weren't hurting hands. Who did he ever hurt? As far as I know, Jesus never laid a hand on anyone. Who'd ever lay a hand on? I'll tell you this, when he did lay a hand on someone, it helped him. May you be that Christian that is hands-on. But let me warn you, it's dirty work. <laughs> you know those Christians that you go out of your way, you serve, and then they stab you in the back? Had that happen, <laughs> been there, done that, you go out of your way and you serve them to try to help them to be a blessing to them and give, 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 and they give nothing back. That's not on you. You did your part. Jesus gave, 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 worked, worked, worked with his hands, and then they nailed his hands. Did he deserve that? No. Well, yet he did it. There's your example. Should we be working with our hands? Should we give our hands to God, say, God? Should we lift our hands to God, say, Lord, I'm, I've mused on your, the works of your hands, now use my hands. Yes, sir. A lot of work to be done. Amen. There is. Can you help a sinner? Amen. Can you help the sightless, those less fortunate? Can you help a saint? Am I telling you anything you can't do? You can. And I, I think it pleases God too. It brings Him joy to see His church with one mind and one accord, like-minded, one toward another, fulfilling His joy. And I hope we've done that here this morning. Amen? All right. Anybody want to add anything? God's good people. Why not enter into His goodness now and experience just how good He's been to you? You spoiled, rotten American. <laughs> just how good God has been to this country and to you. And you need to pray for our country. If things really start getting bad, you know what we're going to need? One another. More than, you ever, more than you could ever imagine, we are going to need one another. And then a lot of these things, you know, because right now we don't necessarily need one another 
maybe in a few things here and there, but if it gets bad, a lot of these things that you're reading the Bible are going to come to life. You'll be like, wow, now I understand this. All right. Well, why don't we pray? Tommy, why don't you pray? Close this prayer.